end of last October. So in the timing of all of this craziness, uh, the fact that I was not responsible for suddenly dealing with the term halfway through that became um, studio by remote with the productions canceled and the summer programs by remote. And I mean, all of that um, somehow, you know, the universe was smiling on me a little bit in terms of, of all of that additional um, complication. And just as I began to resume my life in the arts back here in Toronto. Fascinating. I can't wait to hear more about your story. Um, just checking one more thing on our, um, on our Facebook here. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, I forgot to hit go live. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was, um, that was unbelievable. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm trying to converse as while well I type, which I'm not very good at wearing all the hats at the same time. Um, but we're almost there. <laughs> we can do this. Um, it's going to be great. We have BFAs, like we can do this. <laughs> we can sing and act and dance, in fact. And chew gum, all at the same and time. And chew gum, at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> Those of you who are in this Zoom room, you're getting a little bit of an exclusive. Yes, hello. Does everyone else also like see the names of the people that are yes. here in this Zoom room with us? Or is that? Uh -huh. I do. No. Oh, great, cool. <laughs> I feel terrible this isn't working right now. Um, well, that's okay. While you're working on it, yeah. Um, for our guests that are here, maybe you could ask a beginning question and we could chat about it. That is a wonderful idea. This is why you're so good at the job that I know you from, which is running um, the entire administrative sure. side of the new studio on Broadway slash being queen of the world um, of our... <laughs> At least my personal life and artistic life, but um, I will start with that. <laughs> um, yeah, let's let's pop into it then. Um, I was going to begin by introducing our project, Artists in Residence, um, uh, which I will do now, <laughs> even though um, we're dealing with technical difficulties. But I want to inform you guys who are in room and you four as well as the um, the basis of our project. Um, as I've written before, Artists in Residence is a platform created by artists for artists with the pandemic leaving many in the industry out of work and isolated from the communities in which they thrive. We saw the need uh, for a place where artists can gather and connect and participate in discussions, create together. Um, and we know that community and social engagement are not only important to our work, but also to our very survival. Um, as for many artists, it's where we get our motivation, it's an outlet for our creative energy, and it's a place to come to reckon with current social issues and cultural events that are affecting us in unique ways as artists. Um, we invite you to check out and keep up with us on Instagram um, and check out our Facebook page. We're going to be posting some details about the projects we are involved in. We um, hold readings every weekend of existing plays as well as workshopping new plays. Um, we have more conversations coming up like this one, more isolation conversations. Um, we're going to be holding open forums for artists and other people to come and join and check in with one another. Um, we're also, most significantly, we have an upcoming play festival called The Quarantine Plays, um, which is featuring six new works by emerging writers written during quarantine. Um, the lovely Allison Reed here is one of those writers. Uh, and we, are, we will begin rehearsing over Zoom. Um, and the goal is for a live performance in Toronto later in the fall, as in compliance with, um, with health regulations. But um, so stay tuned to more information with that. But without further ado, I do want to stop talking and turn it over to you guys. Um, but uh, so my first question for you was basically, um, you've all recently transplanted back to Canada um, and ending up in Toronto. So I want to know what that experience has been like individually for all of you and how it is that each of you came to be in the city at this time. Allison, why do you start? Sure. 
<laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll jump in. That would be easy. Okay. Okay, right, great. Oh, go ahead, Allison. No, 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 you go ahead. You got it. Okay. Um, so for me, it was, uh, this was a plan, um, you know, that I had the, in the last couple of years after um, nine years of working at NYU and uh, in the Department of Drama and running the new studio on Broadway, um, which was an intense situation, not only being responsible for the um, schedule and the studio classes and the practicum, but also producing about 12 shows a year. Um, I decided that I would phase myself out as it were over sort of a two year period and really make a plan to come home again um, after the nine years, um, which I described earlier as hanging up my tap shoes. Mm -hmm. So it was time to come home. Um, you know, given the, the climate in the States and of course now with what has happened in the last six months, um, it did seem like the universe was providing a little bit for me, which I was happy to accept. Um, my, I always had my life here in Toronto running at the same time as my life in New York. So it was a question of, of getting back on track to the life that was here with good friends and family and my home and, and my other, the, the other part of me as an artist, as an actor, as a writer, as a creator. So, so I'm thrilled to be back at it. Um, I never expected it to be exactly what it is right now, but this has proved actually to be a very creative time for me, which I know we'll talk a little bit more about. So that's me. That's fantastic. I'm so glad that you're back now. I felt very lucky because I came back here in November of 2019 and like we kind of came back around the same time mm -hmm. well, so it was nice to be making that transition with the buddy almost. Yes that's right. Yeah how about you Allison I know you came home after um uh like I I spent a year in New York after graduating I think you did the same. I spent about two years after like two and a half after I believe about two um which was great like I initially had thought I might come home right after graduation, but then uh, had, I had a job right away um, in a restaurant that I liked and I felt like, you know, I'm here already, might as well keep going. Um, and I, it really, I'm so grateful that I stayed for that time because it's what led me to start writing because all of a sudden I was like, oh no, oh no, we're not waiting for the phone to ring. Like I, I gotta do something about this. Um, and, uh, wrote a couple plays, submitted them for festivals, got into festivals and was like, oh, great. Um, and once I started doing that more, I felt like I could move to Toronto and I had some, uh, I, I had some, some stuff that I'd done that I was proud of and that I could keep doing here. Um, so when I decided to, I mean, it was kind of a two week period that I decided to move, but the plan was always to start uh, to, to come back here because this is where I've, I've spent most of my life um, and I loved New York. New York was amazing um, and I feel like honestly moving back I just keep appreciating my education like all, all the things that I learned while in New York are so applicable here mm -hmm. um, and uh, I also just I, I really since I was really little I've uh, always wanted to be a part of the Toronto theater scene mm -hmm. um, and I think there could be more, like I really feel like we could, there's already so much that's here, but there could be so much more here. Um, and so I felt like in coming back, if I could be producing and, and acting and writing, and doing all the things and hopefully contributing in a meaningful way, um, but also participating in a meaningful way, then uh, that would work great. Um, and I also just at the time felt like I could breathe a bit easier here. Mm -hmm. um, both in in this uh, political sense, but also uh, I think in a mental health sense as well. Um, my family's here, and uh, I still have really wonderful friends here. I have really wonderful friends in New York as well. But uh, I just feels like there's a bit more room for breathing, mm -hmm. I'd say, um, which I'm really appreciative of. And I feel like has led me now to feel like okay, I've I've gotten a bit of a break. What do I want to do next? Mm -hmm. yeah yeah I definitely feel those same um 
that room for breathing resonates with me. So does the, I've always wanted to be a part of the Toronto theater scene. There's a lot that I love and there's a lot that I want to bring back with me from New York and exactly. put out there and add to this community. But I think yeah. it's interesting is so you grew up knowing of the Toronto theater scene. You grew up here. Mm -hmm. um, Janelle, you came up for years and years working in this um, city, which I want to get back to very soon. But Zia, you never lived in Toronto before. No, and no. So you find yourself here. Yes. Well, so very similarly to, I think, um, what the other two have just said, Toronto was always like part of the plan. Mm -hmm. I always knew, like, you know, beginning with, you know, freshman year at NYU, I kind of knew that my time in New York was probably going to be finite. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as you get closer and closer to graduation and there's this impending deadline of like, you must leave by this date um, unless you somehow get super, super lucky. Um, Toronto was always, you know, sort of the end destination being that I went to study theater and, you know, having lived in New York for a while, I just wanted to be in sort of the next big city that I could sort of plant myself into. Mm -hmm. um, but I found myself back here in March after, so in, rather than, I didn't particularly want to, I don't know, for something about moving, quote unquote, back to Canada mm -hmm. directly after spending, I went to high school in the States as well. So I, I had spent a total of eight years living in the States and um, my family and I also hopped around quite a bit when I was younger um, from different countries and all that stuff. So my time in the US is actually the longest time that I've spent um, continuously <laughs> in one country. In New York, five years, that's the longest I've actually spent ever in one city. And so I guess I, I, I had some very strong like emotional ties to New York and I didn't want the narrative, I suppose, to be like, I got kicked out of the US, I let my visa expire and I have to go back to Canada. Mm -hmm. So I did what any delusional 23 year old did. I uh, went over to England. There's a beautiful reciprocal working holiday visa arrangement where they let you move over there for two years. Um, honestly, initially just to get away from theater I, I sort of, you know, with with being an actor and all that stuff, we kind of go through phases with our relationship to our craft. And I was going through a little bit of a breakup <laughs> with theater and um, wanted to sort of distance myself from truly like being an actor and from from artists in, in, in general. I kind of was like, what what does it feel like to experience life as someone who's not in the arts? I just wanted to give that a try. So I went over there and um, did, a, did a very brief design degree, um, like one of those boot camp style full-time design programs, graduated from design school, started working in cocktail bars and kind of just, you know, was, was using my time in England as a time kind of just to, I don't know, li live out my twenties, I guess, if that makes any sense. I think, I think a lot of us artists to have this like, we're in love with like our destinies in a way. So like, we're always thinking about, we're always thinking about like what, what, what story is my life telling, you know? And so I was over there in England and I was like, well, I don't, you know, I want to travel. I want to travel. I want to be able to go to Europe. I, or I want to be able to go to Ireland for, you know, nine pounds. I want to go to Germany for 30 euros. And so that was a huge part of the reason why I moved over there and sort of just didn't initially intend on pursuing anything artistic. I'll wrap this up super quickly. The funny thing well, about all of that. I mean, that I, would, I would argue that you were, I mean, I would argue that you were pursuing everything artistic by doing that. Well, yes. Because you yeah. actually don't have anything to bring to the table and bring back as an artist, unless you are having those kinds of experiences. Exactly, exactly. And actually, so by the time I moved there, um, I had sort of spent my year in New York and, kind of just grown so much as a person that by the time I moved to England, um, I found myself missing art and missing theater so much that actually about four months in to my time in, in England, I, I, I was like, oh my God, I don't know who I am anymore. I, I don't like, what, what am I doing? So I actually, uh, Somehow I got, I got myself an agent and I was auditioning throughout all of 2019 and um, the earlier portion of this year in England, which is super, super interesting. But I think, and I never like put that much of uh, a, a, a focus on it. I was like, this is sort of something I do, but also none of my friends there 
were really actors. So I was just kind of like, you know, working in cocktail bars and all of my friends were my restaurant people and a mm. handful of other um, NYU grads that also ended up there. And like, you know, I kind of felt like I was living a double life because I would get an audition and not be able to like talk to anybody about it and like secretly, you know, like go in between work and, you know, whatever else I had going on. And yeah. anyways, that was a whole thing. Um, but yes, and then I ended up back in Toronto back in March. Um, and I've just been, yeah, sort of playing the waiting game of like waiting for things to come back. And mm -hmm. I'm excited to be a part of the Toronto theater community. It's not one that I've been in, been a part of, but right. it's one that I've always wanted to, to be a part of, yeah. That's great. It's going to be interesting to, um, to, I mean, part of me is wondering when we do come back in this Toronto theater community, what is it going to look like? Um, yeah. And I think, at least I'm feeling, um, you were speaking to Elizabeth Zia about kind of not really knowing, I mean, this is something that I think we face as artists. I, I'm, all of us at different times of what is my identity away from my art? Mm. And yeah. all of us being forced during this pandemic time to take a step away from what we are doing and what we were kind of, I know that I came back, I directed a small show, I felt on a roll, I was starting to make contacts in the industry, I was so excited to keep going. And I had to force myself to stop and kind of think of what else am I passionate about? What is happening in the world? What can I read about? What am I interested in? Um, yeah. And it's making me want to, um, you know, help to maybe change culture of theater in the city for when we open back up um which brings me to the question i'm, I'm kind of going off i mean off script here but my what's coming up for me <laughs> now is like what do you guys um imagine for this post-pandemic world here in the theater scene in toronto Ooh. and what do you hope that it will look like oh. <laughs> Well, I think there's no getting back to what we thought, what we considered to be normal. I mean, that's gone. Mm -hmm. um, a, a next normal, a new normal. I know those are phrases that are getting sort of bandied about. Um, I think that it, it's, it's going to be kind of a slow um, and I hope forward progressing, moving, you know, trajectory that, that things are going to slowly start to phase up and phase in. Um, and, and then at some point, hopefully, when there is, you know, both uh, a cure and a vaccination, which everyone has had, then we will be as close as possible to, to what the next normal will actually be in terms of gathering the way that we used to um, in those kinds of numbers on those occasions. And whether or not that takes two years, five years, or 10 years. I mean, who's, who's to say at the moment? Um, but everyone seems to be making strides to, to begin to work together, both in theater. You know, um, there's a, um, uh, Ken Stage is doing a series of dances in High Park right now. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, they're getting back to a performance. Um, and, um, and also the production companies in Toronto have opened up again. Um, I had, uh, I had booked the next episode, uh, on The Handmaid's Tale, just when everything shut down. Um, and my shoot date is now two weeks from now because they're back up and running as of this oh week. Oh my gosh. Oh, that's awesome. So, so I received the 51 page, uh, COVID protocol production company, MGM and province of Ontario document and had my mandatory Zoom meeting with producers and doctors and medical folks all about what was going to be happening on the set. Um, and so slowly with these safeguards and things in hand that they've been working on for eight weeks at least, uh, things are starting to open back up, which is terrific. It's going to be very different than it was, but at least, you know, we are making a start. Yeah. Janelle is interesting because I was wondering, you you lived in Toronto, you worked in Toronto in mm -hmm. theater film, you were a casting director. Mm -hmm. I'm going to blaze over your um, illustrious resume to get to <laughs> my question, which is, um, does it feel like you are, I mean, what I'm sensing is that you're, uh, you're returning to a community that you um, grew up working in, but that you're also really coming back to a new normal. 
Yes, no, it's, it's very, very different. Um, you know, I'm coming back to a community that I hadn't been part of in any meaningful way because I was in New York mm -hmm. and doing something else completely different, um, though still being of service in the arts in some way, which was satisfying. Um, you know, and, and the players have changed, you know, um, the, uh, I mean, it's, it has changed. There are many people I don't know, but fortunately there's tons of people that I still do know. And so it made sense to be able to come back and start to sort of re-embrace my community and be, and funny as an actor, you know, to start to go back out for film and television, you know, get the old broad photographs done with David Lay's. Um, and, uh, and start to go out again, which was great. Um, and really to reconnect with my community in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. And then of course it was all stopped at that moment in time. Um, but, you know, it's there and we are all, good. so there you go. Mm -hmm. I'm curious cause we, so ZA, Allison and myself know you, um, having all attended the new studio on Broadway at Tisch as the head administrator slash I was saying like queen of the world person who ran um, everything basically kept me sane. I personally threw a lot of my experience there. Um, and I think very few people know the ins and outs of everything that led you up to that job. Um, can you tell us a bit about you're starting out. In well, sure. Yeah. Give us um, when I was when I was your age, um, you know, I was going to be a French teacher. And between my second and third years of university at U of T, um, I knew of a theater company that was having auditions. And I'd always been, you know, a funny kid who could sing. And so I auditioned and I got a job. And that job came with my equity card and I stayed, it was the original Smile Company. Um, and I stayed <gasps> with them for a full year. Um, and I began to do commercials. And then this sort of cabaret in those days in Toronto, there were probably at least six, if not eight cabaret venues around the city um, and began to do that kind of work. And also um, there was a place in Niagara on the Lake that had cabaret as well. Um, and I spent six months, two different summers working there, living in a house with my fellow actors, having a great time. And but because I had been on track to be a French teacher, it wasn't until I was actually working as an actor that I began to take singing lessons, scene study classes, dance classes. And so it was kind of like a uh, self-directed, you know, I was my own Gallatin, if you will. <laughs> you know, working that out um, while okay. I was working. And, uh, and so I had 20 years of, you know, um, working mostly in theater, but with some television um, and had the nearly four years of doing the original Canadian company of Les Miserables and t traveling the country and um, two year and a half stints at the Royal Alex. Um, and that was fantastic. But then, you know, we all have to tr make transitions depending on the times. And it was one of those, you know, you're funny, you're 40, you sing, who cares kinds of moments. Mm. Because the number of parts in the canon dwindles as you get older. And there are a number of talented women, any number of whom could play these parts that are, uh, are being produced. So you begin to reevaluate. And for me, what that meant was there was an artisan transition grant that was administered by Theatre Ontario and funded by the Ontario Arts Council. And I applied for it and received it and worked for 10 weeks with the producer at the Stratford Festival um, to have three weeks in, in communications and publicity, three weeks uh, with the production manager, four weeks with the producer. And when I was finished, she asked if I would stay three days a week. So I came back and then after three months, it was a full-time job. So that sort of made my transition. And at that point I had a five-year-old son as well. So I was rethinking the touring and the traveling and all of that mm -hmm. as well. Um, and then subsequently, you know, we moved from Stratford back to the city 
and I began to work in administration and programming at the what was then the O'Keefe Center um, slash Hummingbird Center slash Sony Center um, <laughs> and really learning um, so much on the other side of the footlights which was great and uh, and then I started to write as well um, and at a certain point I I began to do some casting work with Stephanie Gorin, which was eye-opening and like a master class in acting, you know, for those 12 years. And went to Ryerson to the School of uh, Image Arts to learn to write screenplays. Um, and then did six months at the Canadian Film Centre as a writer in residence for a program there. And so at the time when I, the new studio on Broadway came on the horizon, it was so interesting because it was as if everything that I had done as an artist, what, it was the culmination making me kind of the perfect candidate for this job mm -hmm. because I had had experience in all of the different areas which would be needed. Mm -hmm. So it was a real right place at the right time. Um, if anybody had ever told me how difficult it would, would have been, I probably would have said no. So the being naive about it was probably the best thing that could have happened to me because it was an extraordinary professional experience and one I wouldn't trade, you know, for the world. Um, and, uh, and between the faculty and the students and everyone, it was, you know, um, satisfying and exhausting. And I'm just so grateful that it was there for me. And now I'm back and exploring, you know, what the next evolution is for me, what the next transition is. That's incredible. It seems like um, I find it almost ironic because you spoke so much about how um, you learned, I mean, you transitioned between different parts of the industry, picking up skills along the way, learning and following the path of what would kind of become right for you. And yet you ended up for so many years working in within a, a specific um, educational institution <laughs> um, at NYU, which of course, as though you were the one developing the program um, from the ground up, basically in your role, it definitely must have come with other confines <laughs> to be in such. Yeah, I mean, I think that in every in every area and every kind of every incarnation of ourselves, we are still artists, mm -hmm. and and mm -hmm. I think that you know, as long as we realize that, you know, kind of the key for me as well is that there is value to saying yes something when you don't actually don't have a reason to, um, and, and so a, and unless there was a really good reason why I should say no to it then why not say yes mm -hmm. and I think that that can really guide us as artists I mean it can guide everyone for every aspect of their life but I think particularly for an artist absolutely and finding, I know, Allison, so you were speaking, you're both of you, actually, all three of you who I have here are multifaceted um, artists. I know that, Allison, you've also done some playwriting, which I believe was something that came to you in a similar vein of what Janelle's speaking to, of something that was almost, um, I mean, when you speak, you said kind of right place, right time situation. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, essentially my last year at NYU, um, which I, to be totally honest, never thought I would get through. And a lot of getting through it was to do with Janelle and Kent. Um, but in my last year, I uh, decided to uh, take a creative writing course. Um, I don't know why, I don't know where it came from, but I was like, I have this, my last year, I'm going to do it. Um, and so I took that class and in that class, all of a sudden I was like, oh, I love this. And every week we present something and I'd be like, this is great. Um, and then we also in Don Elan's class were working on, we got assigned a, a person um, and then had to create a, a piece. Um, and I had Wallace Simpson and created a piece and Don Elan and I were like, oh, this is cool too. Like, like I all of a sudden was like doing a lot of creating myself. And then uh, the free play festival came up and I wrote an acapella musical cause I'm a crazy person um, and I can't write music. So I was like, well, I can, I can kind of figure out the song part. It'll just have to be acapella. And everyone was like, okay. Um, and did that. Um, and then, so throughout my last year, I was writing a little bit without even really acknowledging that I was writing. I just was kind of doing it cause it was bringing me joy. Um, and then when I graduated, I basically um, kind of what ZA was saying earlier, I stopped 
like I wasn't really auditioning. I, I kind of gave myself a bit of a break. I was working in a restaurant um, and I had two experiences uh, that led me to be um, essentially full of rage, um, uh, which ended up being kind of the impetus for both plays. Um, and so all of a sudden I wrote, Rage wrote two plays and uh, I, I'm somebody who uh, we'll be like, ah, I'm just gonna submit to a thing and like, we'll see what happens, whatever, rejection is great. Um, it's not great, but like, it happens, whatever it's like. Mm. Um, so I submitted to a couple festivals and got into all of them um, with these plays and then had to figure out which ones I wanted to do. Um, and it didn't actually really occur to me that the plays would be in front of any anybody, which I think the, um, that kind of naive wow. way in really benefited me like kind of what Janelle was saying earlier with going into uh, the job at news studio um, because I don't think I would have been as honest in either play had I known that anyone was ever going to watch either of them um, but I ended up writing these plays and then all of a sudden I had to figure out the whole producing side of it because uh, that hadn't occurred to me either that all of a sudden I'd have to be casting and producing and figuring out the lighting and whatever um, and I had no, had absolutely, absolutely no experience with it beforehand. Um, so all of a sudden figuring that out and learning that I had watched other people do it for years and had, uh, watched really amazing people do stuff like that for years. So I had picked up more than I had thought, um, and actually like liked doing that. And I, and being on the other side of the casting table, all of a sudden I was like, oh, I get it. Like everyone's saying for years, mm -hmm. especially in school um that the other people the people on the other side of the table want you to get the job they want you to be great i was like yeah yeah okay sure you want me to be great that's that's fine and then was on the other side of the table and was like come on like this will be the person um and it changed my whole outlook and honestly auditioning has been so much easier since starting to do that um but yeah so all of a sudden i i kind of threw myself into writing and producing um and i started my theater company, um, Red Wit Theater, um, because I had to come up with a name for these festivals. And then I was like, great, this is my theater company. We're going to do this. And uh, as soon as I moved back to Toronto, um, I produced uh, Living with Olivia Cadence Donovan, um, which I'd just done in New York here so that my friends and family could see it here. And then I uh, was like, oh, I could keep producing stuff and I can audition for other people's things and, and kind of do other people's things, but also do my own thing. Um, and realized how much joy it was giving me. Just really the not waiting for the phone to ring piece of it. Um, mm -hmm. As someone who likes to have a lot of control um, yeah. over my life and uh, most things, uh, it really is so freeing to be like, okay, great. Um, you know, right now there are no auditions I'm gonna write or right now um, I'm auditioning a bunch and not booking things. So like, I'm gonna produce something and I'm gonna cast people and give them jobs and pay them because I can. Um, and like I'll fundraise the shit out of this and then, oh, sorry for swearing, but we are, we are. Um, but uh, like figuring out a fundraise, all these things, all these things that you have to figure out because the end goal uh, is theater. And if no one else is gonna do it, I gotta figure out a way to make it happen because otherwise I'm gonna be pretty miserable. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answered your question, but that's, <gasps> That's my answer. <laughs> that's a great answer regardless. I mean, I think that's fantastic. It's interesting because you're also speaking kind of about um, like picking up new skills and learning new things because of necessity. Um, well, it, it's interesting because my, my mom runs a, she essentially helps uh, Canadian kids apply to American schools and I was her <laughs> guinea pig. Um, and she made me take this test while I was still in high school um, that told you what job you should have. And essentially like actor was one of the top ones, but it was like, you're also gonna be really bored as an actor because you uh, like you're, you actually have a, an affinity for so many other things. And I was like, okay. And at the time I was so offended by this result that I'd gotten that was like, you also should be producing, you also should be directing, you also should be doing all these other things. And like, yes, you're gonna be, a, you know, an actor suits your personality, but you should be picking up all these other things too. And uh, it really took me like six years from that point to be like, oh, you yeah, know, I like to yeah. do the other things as well. And it doesn't make me less of an actor. It actually, or like make me, you know, in the room, people are going to think of me as something other than an actor. It actually adds value. It, mm -hmm. it took a very long time yeah, to get to that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I believe that. I feel like that's something that coming out of, um, I went to school with you guys for performance, but I also had a strong interest in directing, a um, little bit of writing. And now coming back to Toronto, I kind of am trying to figure out which, I think I do kind of get stuck in that same trap as we all might at certain points of like, which hat, am, like, which is the one that I'm going to be wearing? Which, how, like, what do I define myself as? But it is, um, especially during this time when like, um, it feels like there's a shift happening. It feels like when we come out the other side of this, everything might be, um, what am I trying to say? My point is, I, I agree with you. I like being able to take whichever hat out of the cupboard I want to, maybe wear two of them at the same time. And I'm curious about identifying with a certain kind of label like that. For example, yeah. ZA, <laughs> I was looking at your website. You are also a graphic designer. <laughs> I want to hear about how that ended up happening, but you have on your website that you're a recovering actor. Oh my God. Makes me laugh because I think that's, I mean, <laughs> that's the label that you identify. That's pretty awesome. That makes sense to me. And yeah. I wonder how you like, that came back around. Yeah. I think it's interesting so Janelle, you you said something like ten minutes ago about 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 how in every incarnation of yourself you're always an artist if you if you mm -hmm. just like know yourself to be one, and I mm -hmm. definitely agree with that. I don't like I you know when I meet someone new I don't say oh I'm an actor or like oh I'm this or I don't I don't really identify with like a job title. I kind of just know that I am a very creative person. So and and, I'll, and also like I get bored easily and I and and. Sorry, I'm having seven thoughts at the same time. But I think I think for me, I don't know if this is gonna answer the question or not, but for me, I am drawn to the spaces where I get to connect with other people. And if I have a great time connecting with those people, then that's a space that I wanna stay in. So like when I was in high school, I did my first musical ever and I had no intention of ever doing musical theater. I had done a couple of plays growing up, but, and, and I sort of sang but I did my first musical because I couldn't kick a ball and couldn't be on any of the sports teams of the high school that I went to. And I, you know, just really liked the people that I met doing musical theater. And so I kind of just followed the sign and followed that to NYU. I skipped school one day, decided to audition for NYU. And then, yeah, it's crazy how that thing happened. But then like, you know, then, then distancing myself from musical theater first and then distancing myself from theater. I, I, I sort of just kind of want to be with the people that make me the best version of myself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they say that you are the average of the five people that you're closest to. And I definitely felt that when I was over in London, detached from this whole life that I had lived beforehand. Um, and I don't remember the original question. Do, oh, do I identify with with what do I identify as? Yeah, I'm just curious about labels in this industry. In general. Yeah, I mean, I think that once you are an actor and like once that is something that you have done, I don't think that label ever really like goes away. And I think for me, like I, I'm currently, you know, I'm not currently auditioning, but I know that once I am able to again, I will be. And so that, you know, is, is I, I'm happy to call myself an actor if, if, you know, I'm landing in a new country and they force you to fill out an occupation on the immigration form, like I will most likely put actor mm -hmm. in that sense. But I also just think that it's very, it's really interesting because the year that I, the, that I, the year after I graduated from NYU, where I kind of was telling all of my friends, like, I'm not an actor, like, oh my gosh, do not call, like, I'm not an actor. I am not an actor. Um, ironically enough, that, 13 month period post graduating from NYU and me leaving New York, I was doing a project, a workshop, a concert, or something of that nature every single month. <laughs> because I went to NYU and people, and I knew certain people, and people knew who I was, and people sort of knew where my skill sets could be plugged into the work that they were doing. Mm -hmm. So I was doing a concert or a workshop or a reading or like a whatever. Every, every single month for that 13 month period, even though I was turning around and telling all of my friends like, oh yeah, but I'm not an actor. Cause I wasn't like auditioning for anything. Mm -hmm. I wasn't like trying to 
pursue, you know, an agent. I wasn't trying to like get in front of casting directors um, because I sort of knew that it was all going to be futile if I had to leave June of 2018 anyways. Yeah. Um, so I kind of just spent that year not calling myself an actor and yet um, was doing a lot of artistic things and then realizing in hindsight, once I wasn't doing a concert every month, how miserable I was, mm. I, I really took it for granted just, you know, the, the small, the small, like four day, four, four performance runs of workshops or like the small concerts that I sang at, you know, in, in, in the back of a bar, like all of those things kind of sustained me, um, in a, in a, from, from like a, an emotional and a mental health perspective that I didn't realize it was doing until I fully was living an artless life. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, not, not to be cheesy, but I, I, I think I would just call myself like a creative person. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I feel very um, good about that because, you know, I, I, I've also now met enough people in my life who are not creative people. And I don't, I don't think creativity and wanting to express yourself mm -hmm. is entirely intrinsic. I think right. it's something that you kind of learn to be good at I guess and when when people tell you when you're younger that you're good at this thing that you do you want to keep doing it because it makes you happy and it also makes you feel you know I don't know affirmed as human mm -hmm. or whatever mm -hmm. anyways that's a that's my seven hour answer <laughs> to that question but you're but you're an artist the bottom line is you're an artist yeah. and I sometimes yeah do acting Sometimes it's through singing. Sometimes it's through writing. Sometimes it's through your, you know, your graphic art artwork. Yeah. But ultimately, you're an artist. And actually, in all of the, so, so I, yes. So to that point, I also like had an epiphany recently where I realized that like the reason why I've done a whole like bunch of different kind of quote unquote survival jobs um, over the last six or seven years, but. Um, you know, I, 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 in the past two or three years, I started uh, getting into working in bars and making cocktails. And I was trying to figure out why, like, working at a cocktail bar was so much, like, I, I never, like, complained about it the way that I complained when I worked, you know, front desk at Lincoln Center. Like, I hated that job. Um, and it was because, you know, in a way, cocktail making and making drinks for people, like, that is still a creative thing. I could never work at a bar, for example, where they just pour beers and open, you know, uh, bottles of wine for people. I couldn't do that. I, I like my job. I like my quote unquote survival job because I'm essentially just making art for people's taste buds in a way, mm -hmm. you know? So yeah, I, I, I cannot help but be an artist. Yeah. So yeah. Mm -hmm. I like the way you phrased a lot of that. And I like that you said, um, part of our mandate for artists in residence, we say it's a platform for creative people to connect um, and to collaborate. Because I do think that that, I mean, whether or not you call yourself an artist or you are making art at this time, or you have ever made art, I mean, you can still want and crave that kind of community to be around and talk with other people who have that creative drive yeah. and sort of miss and need and require that outlet and space um and we are really interested in the way that these kind of creative spaces can affect and support artists mental health um and i just kind of want to put out to all of you like i'm curious if anyone has felt that or has had any experiences where like um it has been your artistic community that has gotten you through any moments, any particularly difficult transition? I, I mean, I know I just answered the last one, but I'll just say really quickly that during uh, this sort of COVID situation, um, I've been reconnecting with a lot of my NYU folk um, and my, and, and, and so I, so I will just say that for, for some reason I'm finding that my connection with other people who have also done theater or other people who are creative is much stronger than, not to say that I didn't, you know, make great friends 
over in England, but there's something very, very, very special about theater people and creative people. And I just found that, you know, when we all kind of uh, digitized our interactions with each other, I, I found myself gravitating and wanting the, uh, the, the, the connection specifically with my, my, my theater people. Mm. Um, people that I didn't necessarily speak to on a regular basis when I was over, you know, living my whole other life. But now that I'm back in North America, I'm finding that like my, my need to be around creative people is sort of like, it's, it's a baseline for me, I think. Um, yeah. Wow. Amazing, Janelle. Well, um, yes, I mean, it's been interesting for me because coming back and, and kind of rejoining into the community here and then having, you know, the, the pandemic and the, the quarantining begin, I've never been sort of, a, I've never really been on Facebook, but what it did was it encouraged me to get on Facebook so that I have connected in a way that I might not have, you know, without the quarantining because I'm, I'm now connected with all kinds of people that I haven't talked to in years. And that's been amazing. And to see how supportive and uh, empathetic, you know, everyone is um, and, and welcoming and positive and, and all of that. And, and frankly, how, how politically galvanized people are, mm -hmm. you know, which has been wonderful as well. Um, when I see, what's going on with certain alums and grads, you know, at NYU. I feel so proud of them to see the way that they're stepping up, you know, at the, particularly at this time. Um, so for me, in a funny way, I think this has resulted in me being more connected rather than less connected. Uh, and the other thing it did for me creatively was I had begun to work on an idea for uh, a half hour comedy television series with two collaborators and we were meeting twice a week at our homes um, and then this happened but because I had been at the NYU NSB at Tisch I had moved up everything onto the Google Drive <laughs> and so we could work yes. um, on a conference call the three of us and in real time be working on the Google Drive on all of the documents that we needed and then we were collaborating on Final Draft as well. So I actually have um, an incredible, what's called a sizzle book and, mm -hmm. and a pilot episode and a, a whole creation of things uh, for this series that did not exist six months ago. We've done two Zoom actor table reads of the pilot. Holy cow. And uh, actors who would never have been available to us mm -hmm. in any normal situation. Yeah. jumped on board to do this with us and were thrilled to have a script land on their desk, you know, and whether or not from the waist down, they were wearing their pajamas, but from the waist up, you know, they had their suit and their tie and their jacket or whatever the character called for. And, and so it's been a remarkably creative time for me that might not have happened, you know, without the current situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Congratulations. That's unbelievable yeah. that you've Now we just need somebody to buy it, right? Yeah. <laughs> Who <laughs> has money? <laughs> um, can I just add something? I don't know if this is like something that you all have felt, but like I feel that my um, relationship with my peers, my, my artistic peers has actually grown stronger mm -hmm. over this quarantine period because there is no more work to boost mm -hmm. people's egos anymore like nobody's taught trying to prove anything anymore and so like we're no longer talking about like oh like i have this thing working on that i'm working on or like yeah la 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 i want to introduce you to this person yada 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 it really there there has been such a profound interest a greater interest in just like how people are doing and where people are mm -hmm. and you know ba back in in pre-covid times whenever you would um, you know, walk into a social gathering with other artistic people. There is a little bit of peacocking that definitely goes on. Yeah, sure. That I, I, I am finding is, is no longer happening as much. And it, it's, it's been refreshing for me <laughs> um, to experience um, 
interactions with people kind of like, like who are we outside of this context of this crazy thing that we do or mm -hmm. this crazy thing that we're trying to do. And I feel like I've just actually gotten to know people a lot better and people are more willing to kind of, um, yeah, talk about themselves outside of their c career or whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And what a great dividend that is. Yeah. 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 I, I feel that too. I feel that in ways that I am, um because there's not anything I'm actively working on, I feel more, it's a strange, it feels um, paradoxical almost, but it's given me a bit more of a drive to um, kind of listen to my heart on what I am passionate about creating or look for, or kind of just bask in whatever inspiration comes. Yeah. Um, you talked a bit about Janelle, about sort of following people their lives on Facebook, the way that people are getting politically engaged, culturally engaged. And um, I think there's something happening too, which I've sensed with artists now is figuring out how it is that we react to this time. Um, I was speaking to a friend who said something about um, not trying just to push past this pandemic and see what's going to happen in the future and plan for it. And kind of not also just um, take it for granted, but to really experience it and not let, which is a tricky balance to not let these, um, what's happening out in the world pass us by, but as creative people, um, to take it in and let that fuel um, the way that we then will work. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, it's funny because I find that I wanted to ask you guys if you, like, what your personal experiences of this pandemic have been. I know we don't have much time left, but because for me, I find that there has been this strange silver lining of being able to really have the space to engage with what's going on. And then as an artist wanting and, like, having the drive to react to it through that creative lens, but having to find roundabout ways of doing that. I can say I one thing I have to keep, kind of keep reminding myself is that it this doesn't need to be a time of creation, right? Like it well, comes comes in waves. Like I think I've found myself uh, like dipping into old hobbies or like crocheting or like doing mm -hmm. doing other things and not feeling like I have to create something. Like mm -hmm. at the beginning I, of the pandemic, I definitely felt like I uh, was forcing myself to write or forcing myself to like come up with yeah. something creative that I have a project to work on. And I found that once I let that go, I could write because I wasn't writing for a product. I was just writing because I felt like writing. Mm -hmm. um, and I also, to be honest, haven't done a lot of creation in my home. Like my home has always been my like sanctuary almost. And I, I had never really had to write or like do do much here like most of the work that I'll do I'll, I'll make sure I get out of my own space yeah. um so it's been interesting to be in the space and to uh to tr like figure out a new I mean Janelle said this earlier a new normal um and to figure out like okay do I even want to create in my space like it's okay mm -hmm. if I don't yeah. um and finding a, a new way to do it and being like all right this chair is my creative chair otherwise like I'll, the mm -hmm. rest of the like giving myself a little, a little uh, space to be creative, but kind of figuring that out. Yeah. Um, but really like the best advice I think I got through the whole pandemic has been uh, anyone who said like, you don't actually have to do anything. Like you could just exist and that's enough. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I've noticed that uh, the stuff that I, the mental health tools that I've used uh, in the past in really busy times have actually come more in handy now. Like it's, it's treating myself as though I'm still really busy or still really stressed or whatever. Um, cause we're, you know, in this crazy pandemic, which is essentially a trauma, like your everyone's body is having a trauma response. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I just, I just wanted to say, like, I, I think it's amazing that people have been able to be creative and I've had moments where I've been able to do that. And then I've had moments where I, you know, been very down. I know a lot of people have been very down mm -hmm. and haven't been able to uh, produce or create things in the way that they would normally. And, and I think that's okay too, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, 
I think that I, I, I'm just going to echo what you just said. I, for me personally, something that I realized was a key ingredient to um, having my artistic senses kind of unblocked was collaboration. I, you, we are collaborators. And when you take out that, when you take the collaboration out of the equation, it's just super impossible to just be in this one space. Like I sleep in that room right there. And then I come to this desk and, and, and trying to force myself to do any semblance of work or trying to, you know, you know, force myself to have creative output. It was just, you know, cause I did the same thing. I went through the same thing back in April and in May reading articles about, you know, how telling me that if I didn't come out of this pandemic with a novel written that I was actually just a lazy person. And like, right. that's not true yeah. because it's, it's creativity has to be fueled by, like I said, collaboration, but I also think you have to be in a certain headspace. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that I also, is, sorry. Oh no, that, that's just, that, that, that's like super difficult to find, um, you know, during this time. So it's, it's I'm, I'm relieving myself of the pressure to like really. Well, that's, that's interesting. And I think that if you come away with one, one positive thing, like that you've taken the pressure off and you've given yourself permission to breathe during this mm -hmm. time and that you don't have to create or do, you can do nothing. Um, yeah. And if you can, if you can somehow figure out how to be kind to yourself in that way and not have any sort of externally imposed um, sort of preconceived notions of how you spend this time. I, I mean, that's probably the biggest life lesson that you could, you know, you've probably emerged from the pandemic you know, with something of greater value than anybody else, if you can just figure that one thing out mm. and yeah. give yourself permission in that sense. I also think uh, we talked about this a bit earlier. If you're not, like the, the way to uh, fuel creation a lot of the time is to live your life, you know, to yeah. go out and mm -hmm. do things that then, mm -hmm. you know, bring in new ideas. And I think all of us, for the most part, feel like it's been a pause, right? Yeah. So yeah. if there's nothing new happening, it's, it's tough to find those new ideas and uh, because you're not being uh, exposed to n new ideas necessarily. I think yeah. there are ways you can uh, try to do that still, but it's not just naturally built into your day-to-day -day right. life. And that's been an interesting thing too. I think not feeling like you're really living. I, I mean, at least for me, I won't speak for everyone else, but uh, yeah. feeling like, oh, we're in pause and I can't, uh, go try new things or be around people and uh, be in non-artistic spaces that then fuel like this crazy artistic inspiration mm -hmm. and being like, okay, so how else do we get there then? What are the other routes we can take to yeah. get to a place or to get to a place where you just feel okay and like you can be kind to yourself? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so true. I think all of the great ideas that I've ever had have been like, yeah, like a reaction to something that happened during the day or like I talked to somebody and they said something and that made me think of something and yeah that's anyways I'm, I'm just reiterating what you said but like yeah when you're not a person out in the world experiencing the world you can't really bring anything to your little writing station mm. or your you know whatever your, your artistic platform so that's mm. yeah so, having said that I have been you know doing a lot of cooking can I just yes I don't know if, anyone else, been, oh, don't know yeah. if anyone else has felt this but you know we have the time or I, you know, some of us do. I don't, I don't want to speak for everyone. Um, but, you know, I, I had the time to, like, make four-hour long stews and 48-hour marinades. And, like, I'm cooking very elaborate meals for myself. And um, yeah. that, is, that is one re And that's also a creative Absolutely. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, I don't know. I've been focusing, I guess, a lot on, on just taking care of myself that way, like feeding myself the way that I want to be fed and not, you know, spending $14 on a salad from Fresh & Co. That never satisfied me. <laughs> oh my gosh. Anyways. <laughs> no, it's very true. Um, the Fresh & Co. But no, I mean, um, all of it, and I think I'll add to, which is um, almost the flip side of that. I think sometimes when without external, um, without like uh, external sensory experiences or whatever, we're kind of normal living life to inspire your art. 
I find that it forces me sometimes to look inward and I've been journaling a lot. I've uh-huh. always journaled a lot, but I've actually been returning to old journals um, and kind of really focusing on my, um, my own like intellectual and emotional experience at the uh-huh. time and kind of letting that be something that fuels um, my interactions, my day-to-day life, anything that I might write or create, which is, um, I don't know if I get, I'm kind of, um, it's not really fair because for me, that's usually where I go. I'm usually kind of an introspective person, but I imagine for some people that might be, um, I don't know, some another way that it kind of is, that the pandemic is shaping the way that um, one's life would, and yeah. art would change. I, I also started sort of journaling as well. Mm-hmm. Um, just as a way to like process a lot of the thoughts that I felt like, you know, were stuck up here and I wanted to just sort of, and, and I started doing uh, that, that, uh, that thing that we were told to do freshman year, the artist's way. I started doing the morning pages. Um, I'm not doing it currently, but I did it for about a month back in July. Um, and it was just really, it felt really good to like feel the pressure of a pencil on a piece of paper as if I was like physically releasing all of these like thoughts and emotions that I was having that like was not kind of coming out when I sat in front of my laptop trying to write it. Mm. Um, But yeah, I've never considered myself, I've never been a journaler. I've never been, I've always kind of been like, oh, what is that? Like, (laughs) does that even work or whatever? And I think, um, you know, with all of the ways of expression being blocked, that was something that I was kind of just like turning to. And it was really awesome. Yeah. I like that. Oh, something that's also, um, yeah, returning to those skills from freshman year. Truly. There's much more to that discussion, but I, I, because I referenced that because Again, a lot of my past journals are taking me through my NYU experience, which is really fun to look at too, and kind of come back to everything anew now, not no longer being in that city, no longer being immersed in my studies in that way, but um, uh, still carrying all of that with me. Um, yeah. Which the last thing I kind of wanted to ask you guys was, I know we've been here for a little while, was kind of just... Yeah. Any advice or thoughts that you have from this um, special perspective of being a Canadian having lived in New York and returning to Toronto? Um, Anything that you brought with you, significant changes? I know I really miss sweet green. I do miss those salads. (laughs) There seems to be a lack of that in the city, which I will always for more um, sweet green, even the sweet green over fresh and co, I must say. I don't know yes. if that's a controversial opinion, but um, I digress. <laughs> well, for me, I would say um, there's something about perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, at various times in your life, you're reminded um, because your perspective changes. And, and when I moved to New York, um, it was a completely different perspective. Um, And even though I had lived there for a couple of years in the 80s, um, you know, in terms of just even the sheer space in which you live, you know, the tiny little apartments and and how much uh, how much of one's paycheck or one's financial resources are going towards that little bit of square footage and I'm living in a house right now, a little semi-detached house in Riverdale. And when I moved into this house 15 years ago, it was from a bigger house. And so at that time, you know, I really felt like it was small. Well, I'm here to tell you after my one bedroom apartment in Alphabet City, I look around this place and go, really? Yeah. All of this for me? You know, so you, you yeah. just, and, and that's just in a physical sense, but, but we are reminded constantly, you know, what the change in one's perspective can be, which is partly as well what the last six months have done for us. Um, so it is embracing the change in perspective and figuring out what you can learn from it 
and and how it helps you get to whatever the next little piece of the of your adventure is yeah beautifully said i miss you janelle <laughs> i'm here i'm right here you are and that's so comforting yeah we're very we're toronto's lucky to have you back i feel no. that way too um but yeah um any other thoughts on that i think that's lovely yeah I feel like I've recently just like, I'm, I'm still kind of like learn piecing together my impression, my initial impression of Toronto. Cause obviously, you know, there, there hasn't been a lot for me to do here because you know, whatever, but I've been just like taking full days just to like walk around mm -hmm. to all of the different neighborhoods. And I would agree that like the, the, the space is something that you immediately kind of recognize and how walkable the streets are. It's, it still has like the, the, the skeleton of like, you're in a big city, but for some reason, I feel like I can just like drop my shoulders a little bit here. And, um, and you know, the scenery changes block by block. So you can be on, you know, Queen West and it's like fully just like packed with, you know, life. And then you turn left and then it's like trees and, and foliage and you feel like you're in the suburbs. And I don't know, I don't know if that was like really a thing back in New York. Um, but I will say, just my final thought is like, I, I had a very, very, very hard time leaving New York. I cried for like 48 hours the day before I left and the day after I left because it was just so hard for me. Um, and I had grown so attached to living there because it was the space, the, the place that I had lived in the longest. Mm -hmm. But then over time you realize that it was not the city that I was in love with at all. It was all of the people there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, circling back to my whole point of like, I, I always, I follow the signs and the signs are, where do I feel, where can I have the best people in my life that I can possibly have? Um, that made me, so this, this past January, it was my second time visiting New York after I had permanently left. Mm -hmm. And I, I finally got my closure in terms of like, I lived here for five years and I actually no longer feel the need to live here anymore. Mm. That, that like attachment that I had the first time that I went back to visit, I'm like, oh my God, like what I wouldn't give to like just live here again. The second time that I went back, it was very comforting to know that I was no longer creating my life with the end goal of moving back to New York. Because that was, that was, for a while, I'll just say really quickly, when I first moved to England and did the design degree, my intention was to become a full-time graphic designer so that I could eventually um, move back to the States via the TN visa. Because if you're a graphic designer with three years experience, you automatically, you, know, you don't need sponsorship, you just need a job offer from um, a US company to move back to the States. And at the time when I first left, everything that I did was to ultimately reach this end goal of moving back to New York. And now that kind of two years has passed, I feel that I can actually shape my life around the things I want outside of wanting to move back there. Um, so that's what I'll say about that. And, um, you know, for my little first impressions of Toronto, I've been here multiple times before, but I really love it here. And I'm excited for what the future brings. I'm so happy to hear that. It's the way it's encouraging you to take ownership of yourself rather than, I mean, apart from the place that you are. Yeah. Yeah. Where else and you're going to say something? I, I think the biggest thing that I have, uh, my kind of mantra over the last couple of years has been, it doesn't matter where I am as long as I'm happy. Um, like that's been the biggest thing and that's part of why I felt like I could move back when I did um because I felt like I wasn't at my happiest and it wasn't I could be somewhere else and that would be okay mm -hmm. um and that like it's really like CA said it's the people that are important like the people and the people I'm surrounded by um as long as I feel like I have kind of my chosen family or actual family around me um that I'm okay. Um, 
but my, my biggest thing, my biggest piece of advice to anybody ever would be, um, you know, if you're happy, you're in the right place. You know, like if you feel joyful and you're not going to feel joyful every second of every day, but like if you're yeah. overall happy, you're in the right place. And it doesn't matter where that is as long as you are feeling joy. And yeah, I, I think, I think that everybody, it's okay, it's okay to try some places and figure out where feels like home to you. And it might be a place, it might be people, it might be um, a thing you're doing um, that actually takes you multiple places. But if you are happy, you are in the right place. Yeah. Yeah. I love that so much. And um, I must say on that note, I'm very happy to have had you all in this place um, in this Zoom room with us for a, about an hour and 15 minutes now. Um, thank you for sharing all those little bits of wisdom. You all have a lot of wonderful things to say and um, especially about your um, transitory experiences, all of you from whether it is from place to place, from career path to career path. Um, I know I'm gonna, I really cherish this conversation and I'm so, so glad that um, crossing our fingers when things do open up, that we have a little bit of a community here of people, um, and the three of you. I, it's nice to have um, have other Toronto tissues and also I'm very proud to be doing whatever we can to connect us all um, virtually right now. So yeah. Is yeah, this is a great initiative that you've created. So congratulations. Yes, that. what an awesome thing you're doing. Woo! You're always welcome here. No, it's all good. Um, hopefully I'll be back soon. I really look forward to talking again soon and collaborating. And thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And have a really good night. Okay, you bye. Peace and love. Bye. Peace and love, safety. <laughs>